Service that never sleeps with a 24-hour client support center. Hello and a warm welcome to Captains of Industry. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen. Joining me in the hot seat this week is the man at the helm of one of South Africa's leading specialist banks, Investec CEO Stephen Kossif. And Stephen, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you, Bronwyn. Take us back to 1980 when you joined Investec. Eight friends and uh, your first day, what was it all about? Of course, Investec had been around for a couple of years. Now, Investec had been around since 1976 as Investec. And uh, I had a joint venture with them from about 1978. All we used to do was uh, do motor vehicle finance or leasing. We used to call it leasing of equipment and motor vehicles to doctors in the accounting profession. And I started a joint venture in 1978 with them because I was in the accounting profession um, after having qualified in, I think, 1975. And uh, in 1980, um, I was sort of half instrumental in acquiring, finding them a banking license. And uh, that's when I decided to join them full time. Would so you classify yourself as, a, or yourselves, as a bunch of young guys sitting yeah. around a table at that time? Yeah, I, you know, there were eight of us in the whole firm. And, um, you know, we knew that we had to take the business to the next step. And we needed, a, we needed to be able to fund ourselves and we felt that a banking license would be able to fund ourselves. And so we, could, we bought a bank that had deposits and very few loans. And that enabled us to not rely on other banks to buy our paper all the time. Because what we used to do was originate loans and sell them into the other banking, sector, uh, banking uh, community. And so we were very reliant on those banks who would switch the tap on and off. And we had a very good client base. We never had any bad debts. And uh, you know, we always believed that we must go after a, a safe and secure pl client base. That's why we picked the accounting profession and the medical profession. How quickly did the business gr grow? And did it surprise you in terms of the trajectory? Yeah, you know, I, I still remember talking to Ian Kant, who was our founder, and we were walking, because we were down in Anderson Street, and we were walking to the Carlton Centre in those days where we used to go and have meetings or go and have lunch. And he was saying, you know, in, in, in a few years' time, we'll be doing these 40 million rand deals. And I said, you know, we're doing 10,000 rand loans to doctors to finance a Mercedes. Where are we going to do 40 million rand deals? This guy is delusional. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, it was just step by step that you added pieces on to the business over many, many years. And in, well, I don't want to stop you there because it sounds as like though it's getting exciting. Yeah. And that was, you know, the development of the business in South Africa for the first, uh, up until 1992. Well, Ian actually left us in about 1984. He went to live in Holland and uh, he, he, you know, he was not enamored with South Africa and decided to immigrate. He was married to a Dutch girl and they decided to leave South Africa and he stayed on in the firm. And I still remember when we listed in 1986. Uh, we got heavily criticized because we listed at four rand a share. It's a different four rand to the days, you know, today's 48 rand. But uh, because the shares have been split and all sorts of things have happened to it over the years. But we did list at four rand a share and then we were one of the few shares that went down uh, post our listing. So and criticism in the early days? I always had criticism and someone wrote in and said, how can a bank be run by a chief executive in a post box? Because Ian gave his address in the prospectus for our listing as some post box in Hilversum in Holland. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we've, always, we've always been a target of criticism as a firm. 1980, as I said, you joined. Yeah, yeah. 1997, you became chief executive. So in other words, you played the corporate game very, very well. What's the secret? I, I just did what I had to do in life. I, I, don't, I never expected to be chief executive. I did every day I got up and said, how can I do the best for my organization? And I was always a very dedicated person in whatever I was done, I've done. So I was dedicated to the organization and I never thought anything else about other than how we build this organization. And Let me committed. rephrase it then. Is that what it takes, commitment to, to climb the corporate ladder? Because Stephen, you did right. it very, very well. Yeah, um, I, I, I think in anything in life, if you're dedicated, committed, and do your best and you, you know, you see things step by step and are not too demanding on the way, 
Um, sometimes things land on your lap that you don't really expect. It's when you're very demanding and say, that's where I want to be, and have worked this plan out that you sometimes never get there. 1997, yeah. the London listing on the table. Um, <laughs> Trevor Manuel gave you a hard time, didn't he? It took him four years until yeah. 2002 when, when that London listing actually came to fruition. Yeah, I think uh, one day Hugh Herman and I went and actually camped in his office because, uh, you know, we never got answers. And, uh, and he asked us if we squatters uh, because we went and sat there and we said, we'll stay here until we get a meeting to say we don't understand what your issue was. And eventually he said, OK, my big issue is I don't want to see South Africa as a branch economy. And therefore, if you go the DLC structure, which is how we eventually listed, I'll give you permission. And, uh, you know, we didn't argue. We said, that's fine, and we took it. You followed the, the BHP model, yeah, effectively. Yeah. And then straight after that, Mondi, well, not straight after, but the next listing to, to come on board was Mondi, also yeah, followed the yeah, investing a, a example. A long time later, yes. Do you regret the London listing, or not has it all. been incredibly beneficial to the group? Not at all. Uh, I think that from our point of view, you know, it's opened up our eyes to a different world. It's uh, given us skills and uh, technology that we would not have had if we just stayed in South Africa. There is no peer group left in this country. People that we competed against in 1992 are either part of other firms as the R&B guys went and acquired First Rand or have been taken over or have disappeared. So we would not have survived as a standalone South African group if we did not migrate ourselves internationally and learn how to become a global player. Let's talk about your, your global position sure. and let's deal with the, the tougher part of this equation, which is obviously Kensington and uh, your foray. Hindsight, they say, is a perfect science. Sure. Uh, analysts can run companies well on paper. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. I didn't know. I've got to interview these guys on a regular basis. Sure, yeah. Where are we with Kensington? And it, 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 Kensington is, a, is history. All we have is a back book that we need to collect. We've created a very effective origination and administration business that can enable us to originate mortgages that are target market type clients. And it's a question of whether we want to put the foot on the pedal or not and reignite that business. And we've learned a, a massive amount about the mortgage industry right throughout the world. And I, I think that, you know, even though it in itself was probably very poorly timed acquisition, the technology that we've learned about that business and about that industry and how we've ma been able to make money on the periphery of that industry over the last four or five years, I think will hold us in good stead for a long time as an organization. But yes, we have a back book to collect. We think we're well provisioned and we'll manage that back book through to its end game. While we're talking acquisitions, let's touch on Rensburg Shepherd evolution how those are faring yeah. for, for the group? Well, you know, Rendsburg Shepherd started with our acquisition of Car Shepherd in 1994. And, um, so we're going back a, a yeah, long, no, it's long, a long way. way. And then it was followed on when we acquired Guinness Mon. There was a piece in it called Henderson Crossweight that we combined with Rendsburg, I mean Car Shepherd, to r create Car Shepherd Crossweight. And then we sold that into Rendsburg's probably seven years ago to, became, to create Rendsburg Shepherd. And then we took Rendsburg back because we felt that this is a core part of our business. We want to own 100% and have more recently added Williams de Bro to that. So when we bought Rendsburg, uh, Car Shepherd originally, I think they managed one and a half billion pounds of third party money in 1994 today through the various acquisitions and organic growth and obviously change in asset prices. We managed um, in, the, in the UK 21 and a half billion pounds. We have 19 offices spread right throughout the UK. All of them are going to be branded Investec. And we have a very strong franchise there. So um, I think that if you take that business on it in itself, what we really paid for it is probably all told 200 million pounds. And it would be ignoring dividends that we've received over many years, probably on a standalone basis bet worth between 600 and 700 million pounds. So, um, you know, we, we think that we built a very strong franchise and that over time, you know, that business will become, is a very much core part of our global offering. 
When we talk about the group now, you, you have really focused it. And if you look at the, the disclosure you're putting yeah. around your, your specialist banking division, your asset management and your wealth and investment, those are your three core sure. lines going forward. You think it's given clarity to the group. Were you perhaps a, a little, I don't want to use the term confused, you may box me on the ears, but in terms of your reporting structure, yeah, this has obviously simplified things. Yeah, I think what we learned was that um, the South African analysts in particular want a lot of detail and a lot of information. So we provided that to them. What we make by geography, what we make by product, and we have, whenever I go on glo global roadshows, they tell me your disclosure is phenomenal. Compared to what they get in international firms, we had a totally different level. But when you have to value our firm, you know, people were really battling. So that's why we created the three separate divisions. You can value, easy to value an asset manager, there are lots of global peers. Easy to value a wealth management business, there are lots of global peers. When you come to our type of banking, there's hardly anyone like us out there in the world. And so we said, okay, see us as a specialist bank. We have five or six revenue streams, we have net interest income, we have fees from giving advice or fees from looking after people's money or from transactional services. We have investment income. We have trading income that comes from customer flow. We have trading income that comes from us managing our liabilities and taking principal positions on our own balance sheet. And those are our five revenue streams. It's also made it a lot easier, can I say, to interview you. Yeah. I've been interviewing you for a long yeah, time. Yeah, sure. And so now you can work out what are the value of those various revenue streams. And what does it cost us to generate those revenue streams? Let's touch on Australia. Yeah. A disappointment in this reporting period, and that was to March 2012. Sure, sure. You had warned the market, though. Yes. We warned the market in September. We took um, what we found was Australia had massive floods last year. Its economy is a two-tier economy. You've got mining, which is booming, and the rest of the economy, which is exceptionally weak. If you look at Australian retailers, their shares have halved over the last year, uh, in many of them. And uh, you, you, you've got a totally different economy to the one we have in South Africa. But macro level still looks like it's doing particularly well. But in s a small segment of the market that we operated within, which is stuff we don't really do there anymore, which was funding property developers um, in a speculative space, we found that as these, as these speculative developments were complete, asset prices had dropped. No different to what APSA was saying today. And as a consequence, to clear a book, we had to take heat. And we took a decision, clear the book so we can have a clean start. Otherwise, it's very hard to motivate people who weren't responsible for originating that book originally. You led me to ABSA. Yes. I might not have asked you. Yeah. OK, fine. The stock fell 8% after their voluntary profit warning. Yeah. Do you think it's a precursor of things to come for the South African banking environment? It could be. I think what, what, what is very clear in the world today, it's very hard to generate revenue. Um, and therefore, if you have every, any weakness in your loan portfolio where you know, the world is not a happy place, um, that is going to be reflected in the bottom line. And so it could be, it may not be. I don't know, you know what other books are in other banks. But certainly, the banking world is a lot tougher than our analyst community actually anticipate. They're not on the ground. They don't actually really understand what's going on until such time as problems hit. And as you say, analysts can only run a business on paper. We're going to a short commercial break. More with Investec Stephen Kosev when we return. Don't you go anywhere.